All right. So, so what is ECMA script five, right? Uh, if, if you've never heard of it, you know you might be thinking, why are you talking about ECMA script in a month and a half? It turns out, you know, the standard ECMA script is basically a standardized for JavaScript. This is a quote from Brendan Eich. Brendan Eich designed the language when he was with Netscape. Uh, he obviously doesn't like the name, <coughs> but that is the is the you know is the scripting language standardized by ECMA International uh, in the ECMA 262 specification. So all those numbers they don't mean anything, but basically it's the standard. Uh, you know there, there's a there's a just like we have standards for everything, right? We have standards for HTML, CSS. Uh, so we have standard for JavaScript. Only it's not called JavaScript; it's called ECMA script. Technically, they're not the same. There are differences, but uh, for all practical purposes, you know, it's uh, you, you can refer to them using the same same word. <coughs> All right. So this was approved. ECMA script version five is the latest revision of uh, ECMAScript. It was approved by ECMA in December 2009. So it's been a while now, actually. Uh, this is the successor to EC ES3, ECMAScript 3. Uh, you know, so you might wonder what happened to ECMAScript 4. Uh, it's not that ECMA went wrong. What happened was, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, basically it was a problem of finding out more than you can choose. So they wanted to drastically make changes to JavaScript, right? So JavaScript has all these problems, some of which we saw in the previous session. So they wanted to really increase the language. And, and you know, they, it was no longer like JavaScript. It looked like something else. So, you know, they kind of, there was a lot of disagreement. They couldn't come to consensus for the standards. And uh, they said, let's just park it and do ES5. So basically, some of the ideas from, uh, from ES, ES4, which, which really does not exist, and they don't make ES5. The next version is codenamed Harmony. As you know, you probably heard during the day today, there are many interesting uh, uh, developments happening in the in the next version of ECMAScript as well. Uh, but one thing that I kind of you know noticed was, especially when I was listening to the session on CoffeeScript, I, I read this blog post uh, uh, you know sometime back where they had called JavaScript as the assembly language of the web. You know, which is a, which is an interesting way of looking at it. Uh, so how many of you here code in assembly language? You guys are kidding, right? No, code in assembly language. You know, so there was this, this view that uh, JavaScript is the assembly language of the web now because you know uh, it has all these problems. There are some nice parts. You know, that, that's another joke. So uh, there are two very popular books for JavaScript. One is called JavaScript: The Definitive Guide. Um, I forget the name of the author. That book is about that thick. Okay, it's a very thick book. It's a reference for JavaScript. You read that, you know everything. Then Douglas Stockford wrote a book called JavaScript: The Good Parts. That was about that thick, right? So. So what is the rest of it, <laughs> right? So um, why did I say that? Yeah. So JavaScript, you know, uh, is being you know considered as a as a as a target for other programming languages like CoffeeScript, right? So CoffeeScript compiles and produces JavaScript, uh, just like your C++ program compiles and produces machine code, uh, produces assembly, assembly produces assembler assembles it and produces machine code. So you know there is this view that that might happen. Uh, which is an interesting take on it, you know. Maybe, maybe things will head that head in that direction, or maybe not. Uh, we'll have to wait and watch. So, what what kind of support is there for ECMAScript 5, uh, uh, you know, as of as of today, in, in across browsers? So, you know, I actually, I ran this test yesterday. Anybody can go and run it. Uh, uh, the ES5 test suite is available on TCMA's. You can just run it in the browser directly. So it has about 11,016 tests, and uh, IE10, PP3, Firefox 7, IE9. So this this graph basically shows you the number of failed test cases. So the lesser is better. Uh, so IE10, PP3 seems to have a very good compliant implementation of ECMAScript 5. Uh, surprisingly, Chrome kind of uh, is is lagging in this particular metric. Uh, but what you will notice is, you know, this is pretty good compliance level, right? So even if you consider Chrome 14. Which is 427 failures. That's relative to 11,016 test cases. That's I think that's a pretty good, pretty good, uh, you know, ratio. So 
as far as uh, stand you know browser support is concerned modern browsers great support for ecmascript 5 right uh, with regard to before we go to that with regard to browser support another thing that we can talk, talk about is ecmascript 5 one of the uh, you know, one of the design goals if you want to say that way it was exactly the opposite of ecmascript 4 right ecmascript 4 which never saw the light of day they were making crazy things right so your ES3 code would not run in ES4 code. Right? They were using backward compatibility was being broken. That's part of the reason why the consensus was not there. And ES5 is exactly the opposite philosophy of ES4. Like backward compatibility is extremely important. It turns out that a vast majority of the ES5 uh, you know, the features, the new capabilities that are available in the language can be completely implemented with ES3. There are some specific parts of it which you cannot implement without support of the runtime, without changing the JavaScript engine itself. But it turns out that a vast majority of it can in fact be implemented using just ES3 code. So <coughs> an old browser which does not know ES5 can still benefit from a new chunk of ES5 uh, just through libraries. Right? In fact, uh, in fact, we look at that. So this is a pretty decent story at least as far as ES5 compliance is concerned. Not so good story on the rest of the web, you know, HTML, CSS. It's a mess. Uh, so, so we can, you know, we'll uh, we'll talk about some of the some of the new capabilities that are available in uh, in ES5. So, <coughs> JSON, right? JavaScript object notation is a pretty popular uh, format for data interchange on the on the web, right? So you send data to services using JSON. Uh, you receive data back from uh, services via JSON, uh, formatted as JSON. Uh, the alternative used to be XML. XML tends to be unnecessarily verbose, right? There's more, usually more metadata than data, right? We'll have a starting tag, ending tag, and one character in the middle, right? And the tags will be like really big. Uh, so you find that JSON is not like that. It's, it's much more terse, like uh, very minimal metadata is there, and you know you actually pay for only the, the data that you're actually sending and receiving. So <coughs> it turns out uh, with ES5, uh, support for serializing and deserializing JSON is available out of the box. Right, so there is a there is an API to do that. It's a very straightforward uh, API. In fact, this was created by uh, by Douglas Crockford, uh, who had a very funny story to tell about that also. Let's maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say that if you have time. Um, all right. So what you can do is so you can, you can you know take any object like this, right? So if you have if you have an object person, oh, okay, maybe I'll call this person. I'll say name. It's that. Oops. Let's say age is that, and you want to, you know, uh, send this particular object to a service as JSON, right? So how will you do that? So you have an API called, uh, you have an object called JSON, and you can say JSON dot stringify. Uh, okay, let's not go down that path. JSON dot stringify of person, right? And now if I just hit enter, you can see that it has actually converted into a string, and it is well formatted json right so json requires for a well formatted json string requires that even your attribute names be enclosed in double quotes right so in fact what i have defined here is not a well formed json so if you actually want to do it correctly you have to do it like this so that's proper json so <coughs> it does this and you can get the you can get the reverse also right so so this is a serialized version of that uh, for that json or maybe let me do it this way so if i if i have a string like this right so i'll say uh, Name, uh, name. I'll have to escape the double quotes. I'll say name is foo. Uh, age is ten. Obviously, a number does not need to be in double quotes because it's a number. Now I can say uh, var o equals json dot parse of s. And now I can say print o dot name, print o dot age. Right. So you can see that. Uh, now we, you know, basically it converted that string into an object. So <coughs> this this particular API was uh, designed by Douglas Crawford. Uh, so we actually wrote a library called JSON2.js. Right? So you can actually go and uh, download and uh, include it in your pages, and uh, and it will work across browsers. Right? So if you have a browser that has this API, right? Like Google Chrome, Safari, Chrome OS, right? Then JSON2.js will automatically use that implementation. You won't try to do anything fancy. If you have an older browser that does not know ES5, then you know, it provides an implementation, etc. So this is an example 
The, the, the funny story that uh, Douglas Stockford mentioned. So he was here in India for the Yahoo Hackathon event, which happened in Bangalore probably a couple of months back. So he was talking about uh, this JSON2 library. And uh, he said that, so he made this library, right? And he, he put a license for that, right? So his license text was this, don't use it for evil. That was his license. Right? It was not GPL, it was not LGPL, it was not MIT, it was not Apache. Don't use it for evil. He assumed that it's about as liberal as it can get, right? Nobody will complain for that. Well, right? it was wrong. So, first of all, I didn't get a complaint saying that, hey, listen, I won't use a library for evil, but any of my customers might use it for evil. <laughs> if they use it for evil, then you might sue me. Right? So, you have to make an exception. Change it. Don't use it for evil, except IBM and then IBM customers. Then what happened was, after two days, Google contacted Douglas and said, listen, we are, Google is a company which says no people, right? And they are problem with us. So they said, uh, listen, we are, we are so open that we are open to <laughs> So we are not, so just because if somebody wants to use Google Maps, if they do something very, very bad, we are not going to stop them. Just because they are not going to use it for very, very bad, right? So if that is the case, those customers are affected by the <laughs> so finally what he had to do was, he took out that license, put it on GitHub and uh, he said, I, the GitHub license now applies, whatever is the default license is there on GitHub. So that's how he resolved that situation. <coughs> he had other funny stories also, but we'll come back to our session. <laughs> um, <coughs> so this is, so so one reason why you might use the, uh, the native implementation is it's, it's way faster than uh, you know, the JavaScript version where it has to actually parse your string. Uh, there's actually another way you can uh, you can do this. Does anybody know? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Eval. Right? So actually what you can do here is, in fact, this is how we used to do it. So we can say var o equals, uh, let me get this right. I think I have to enclose this in a bracket, right? Then I can say o dot name o dot h. See that works as well, right? Uh, but just because it works doesn't mean that you should use it. <laughs> the reason is, this is extremely, okay, one, one reason is it's insecure, right? This piece of string, I have typed it here, but that you might have got the string from anywhere, right? Uh, from the web, there might be a hacker sitting in the middle who might have changed your string and given it to you. Uh, you know, somebody might have just uh, changed this to, you know, something like this. Uh, window dot open of hacker dot com uh, cookie equals plus document dot cookie right and we'll just happily eval that so it will basically do a window dot open take your session cookie and set it uh, and now we can make that session <laughs> so this is extremely insecure uh, so if you want to do this then you have to go and sanitize this validate it a whole bunch of headache don't try to do that use the library and it is faster because it's implemented in the engine directly. It's it's way faster than doing it yourself. There are a whole bunch of new array capabilities that are available in ECMAScript uh, ECMAScript 5. Uh, these are some of my you know most favorite enhancements to to uh, to ES5. Uh, note the pro PPD tip if you want if you want to. <laughs> so what I'll do is I'll create one array here. Okay, array of numbers. So there are, uh, you know, for example, you want to iterate through uh, an array. How do you typically do it? You say for var i equals zero, i less than i dot length, i plus plus, and and all that, right? Now you have a, a functional way of doing it. So you can say array dot for each, and you can pass a function, which will be, you know, it's basically an, a predicate, right? Which will get invoked uh, for every element in the array, right? So it's basically uh, for each is very simple. It's just it's, it's, it is doing for var equal i equals zero, i plus, and so on, and it's calling your function. <clears throat> Again, this is an example of a, of a functionality that's there in ES5, which is very easily backward portable, right? In fact, if you look at the look at the Mozilla documentation for uh, oh, I don't have my data card here. Okay, 
So I'll plug this in. By the time it comes, we'll. There is a Wi-Fi. Has Geek. Anybody know this? Geeks are us. Good password. Uh, so as you can see, I'm on Windows 8. Somebody complained that I'm doing all my sessions on Windows 8 and didn't even show the, the home screen. So now I show to you. <laughs> all right. So MDN array dot for each. So you'll note, if you look at the documentation for many of the ECMAScript 5 features, uh, the Mozilla documentation actually provides a, a fully compliant, most of the time, a fully compliant implementation of that particular uh, API in ES3 syntax, right? So which is, which is really neat. Uh, so you can simply take this and, you know, plug it in into your project and uh, you'll have, you know, and, and they check for it, right? They do feature detection. They'll check whether for each is not there. If it's not there, they'll add it to the prototype for array. And then you can just call it, right? In browsers where you have support for it, it'll be native. Otherwise, this will work. So, in fact, for all of these uh, API calls, you, uh, this is what I was meaning. Like, you know, most of these API, uh, ES5 APIs are available for older browsers. And it's easy to, not easy to implement, but it's possible to do it. Because to do it correctly, there's a lot of work, right? Error handling, a lot of stuff. So, um, so you can do this. Uh, what else? So you have filter. Filter is another interesting method. Uh, what you can do is function. I get a value, and I can apply basically a predicate, and this returns uh, another array, right? So I'll say array two equals filter of this. Let's say the canonical example is that. Then I can say print array 2. And you can see that uh, from 1 to 10, I have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 because I'm filtering for uh, even numbers. So, you know, filter allows you to do that. You have map. Uh, you, you see the two functions, map and reduce. You've heard of that before? Map, reduce, map, reduce. <coughs> Google, map, reduce. So, this actually, this is the fundamental uh, foundation on which map, reduce is based on. Uh, <clears throat> array dot map and I can say uh, so basically this transforms your uh, uh, transforms a se in, in general terms it transforms one sequence into another sequence that's what it does in this case it transforms an array from one kind of array to a different kind of array however it is right so for instance I can say uh, return v star v uh, and you can see that uh, you know basically squared all the numbers <coughs> Right, so one, four, nine, and all that. So, and, and doesn't even have to be numbers, right? So, for example, I can say v dot two string plus uh, boo or something, right? So, so now you have an array with one boo, two boo, three boo. So, <coughs> basically, I've changed the type also now, right? It does. So, any kind of transformation can happen. I take numbers, convert to strings, uh, anything, anything that can go into a legitimate JavaScript array can, you can can be returned from uh, from this. In fact, JavaScript arrays are a bit funny that uh, it can be different types in different locations also, right? Array of 0 can be an object, array of 1 can be a number, array of 2 can be a string, array of 3 can be a something else. So all that you can do. Uh, reduce is very similar, except this doesn't uh, produce another array. It produces a single value. So in fact, uh, it accepts two parameters and you can uh, do some operation on it. In fact, you can pass a initial value also here. So, for example, I can say 5 and here I can return uh, v plus, sorry, v1 plus v2 uh, and then I can, oh, I did a pack. So it's all gone. So, I'll just keep 5 elements here. So, what you can do is you can say uh, var val equals array dot uh, reduce of function of v1 comma v2 and you can do this so you can say return v1 plus v2 uh, print back right so it says it's 15 
So what, what really happened here? So I can, I can initialize the value also here. So now it says 20. So which means that for the first call of, uh, of so basically this function is going to get invoked for every element here, right? Uh, so first it will call this with, so in fact what we can do is we can print that. So that it's very clear what's going on. So sprintf, v1 is this, v2 is this, v1 comma v2. So you can see what's happening. So here, you know, v1 is 5 for the first iteration because that's what we passed as initial value here in the second parameter. And the second parameter is the first element of the array and so on. So what is the first element here? The sum of what I returned in the previous. It's basically, uh, you know, it's uh, collapsing your array into a single value, right? So here I'm just summing all the values up. Now you can, you know, whatever is applicable in your scenario, you can do that. So it's a very, you know, it might sound like it's a very simple thing, but it's actually a very powerful uh, notion. <coughs> You have an array of strings. Yeah. Yes. So, so I have S1, S2, S3, uh, and you want to work on that, right? So V1, V2, and all will be S1, S2. So whatever operation, uh, what shall we do? I don't know. So, so that's what you get. Yeah, yeah. So S zero, right? <coughs> so that's because I said percentage D. Uh, so we have too much mark there. Okay. So yeah. So any 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 element, it will work on any element. <coughs> so that's uh, that's map and reduce. Index of is a is an interesting function, but I'm kind of disappointed with that API. <laughs> So what you can do is you can say index of S2 and it will say it is 1 or I can say index of S3, it will say it's 2. What I would have liked to be able to do is pass a function here so that I can specify what is my selection predicate, right? However I want. Here you can't do that. I have to give a value. So you know in this case it might not be such a big deal. So for instance, uh, what if I have, what if I have uh, an array of objects, right? So Let's say uh, a colon 10, uh, a colon 20, uh, a colon 30, right? So I have three objects here, and uh, how do I search now, right? So I'll essentially have to search for something like array of one, then it'll give me that, right? Uh, what I want to be able to do is imagine a more complex object, right, which has many fields. I want to get all those. Uh, I want to get the index of. Let's say it's a it's a collection of person objects with an address. I want to get uh, somebody who is in Bangalore. So basically, I want to be able to give that condition. Can't do that. Filter method is there. So you will get one array, an array with one element. Yeah. Yep, we can do that. So then we have a useful function called every, which, uh, which returns a Boolean, true or false. So what you can do is, for example, here I can say, uh, are all the A's in this array numbers? So if you want to ask a question like that, so I can say for uh, array dot every function of O, so I'll say, uh, so what will be the, see with JavaScript I can never say <laughs> what it will say for type of. So what do you guys think it's going to say? Array of 0 dot A. Anybody wants to hazard a guess? <laughs> number, hopefully, yeah, number. So you have to check, otherwise I can't tell. So I'll say uh, return type of o dot a equals number. Okay. So this is expected to return a boolean value. So it says true, right? Because it is it is true that uh, let me format that a little nicely. So in this case, it is true that every element a property is a number. So if I go and make this a string, for instance, right, it returns false now because even if one element does not satisfy your condition, the whole expression evaluates to false. So some, anybody wants to guess what will happen? So at least if one of them is uh, a number, it will satisfy the condition. The only time it will return false is if all of them are 
not numbers. All right, so those are some interesting array uh, enhancements. These are new to ES5, not there in older, uh, 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 in the older version of this of the spec. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, chances are the regular loop will be faster, but uh, <coughs> I, I, again, as, as somebody else asked in the previous session, those are micro optimizations, right? So, at, uh, what I would suggest is go with for each. The reason is, when you use for each, right, you are operating at a much higher level of abstraction. Now, who knows what JavaScript engines can do, right, with that? So, for example, tomorrow, right, uh, somebody comes up with some tremendous advancement happens in JavaScript engine implementation. Somebody discovers that in certain situations, uh, a, a certain iteration uh, function can be parallelized on multiple cores. And the JavaScript engine wants to do that optimization and they implement it, right? If we uh, operate at a higher level of abstraction, other than saying, you know, start this iterator, you know, initialize this, this value, check this condition, increment this, and go do this, you know, that's basically something that uh, a computer cannot reason about, that logic. In fact, if you see, you know, the evolution in, in all in most languages, like for example in C sharp, you know, uh, with C sharp 3.0, they introduced uh, link based programming. Then, you know, then uh, basically what it allows you to do is express some intent at a higher level of abstraction than uh, you're doing at a lower level. So, from that sense, I think it's always safer to do that. If you, what I would suggest is use for each and all these new capabilities. If you have a performance issue, optimize. Chances are you will not have issues here, it will be somewhere else. Um, so the nice thing about using those libraries is they might revert to for each if for each is supported because that will probably be faster than the JavaScript version of it. Uh, if it is not supported, then they'll do the correct thing. So that's nice. <coughs> the the object model, uh, you know, there are some new uh, functionalities available. We saw some of these in the uh, in the previous session. We saw get prototype of. We saw the keys prop, uh, method. Um, so let's let's see some of the other interesting things that ES5 brings to the table. So for example, right. Uh, JavaScript is, is is too dynamic for its own good sometimes, I think, right? So, you know, I can have a I can have an object like this, uh, right? Now, nothing stops, nothing stops anybody from, you know, going and uh, doing something like this, right? I mean, this, this will work perfectly fine. So, if I say print .o foo, then, you know, that, that works fine. Whoops. Uh, you know what stops somebody from doing something like uh, string dot uh, uh, let's see or or let's see some other uh, some other thing array dot prototype dot join is there right so I'll say alert ha no join right so now if I have uh, an array like one, two, three, right? And uh, I try to say print array dot join of comma, right? So what we get is this. Why are we getting it so many times? <laughs> I think I'm stuck now. Any idea why we're getting so many times? Okay. Yeah. Weird. So you can do all that, right? You can go change some standard functionality, and uh, you know, uh, and you would never know. So that that's in fact one of the reasons why, you know, for example, it's considered a best practice to not do this. Var r equals new array uh, of one, two, three. You know, this also you can do, right? So if I say print array dot length. Uh, it will say 3, you can access 0, 1, 2 and all that. But this can, this syntax can be hijacked, right? Some, you can include some library which is not well designed, they were not disciplined about not polluting the global scope. They might go and, you know, define their own array and then when you say new array, you will get their array instead of the standard array, right? This can always happen. So it's always considered a best practice to use this syntax to define. 
your so this is an empty array right or you can initialize it with some values this cannot be hijacked because this is a language feature right language syntax this will always be a javascript array the same way same thing goes for creating objects uh, you know do that if you want to create an empty object don't uh, you know use any of the apis like you can say object dot create for that but anyway those are some things to remember more gotchas so object dot create has some very very nifty capabilities now so for instance i want to create a i want this all what just happened right i want to create a uh so I, i'm going to talk about this now okay prevent extension seal and freeze so what we will do you have to create an object create a new dynamic property called foo on it right and we want to disallow that so what i can do is i can create an object like this so name is this uh so that's done now what you can do is you can say object dot prevent extensions of o right now if i say o dot boo equals bar and print o dot boo you know nothing is going to happen or if i say type of that it's going to say undefined right because basically this is getting ignored this particular line of text got ignored uh so that's because this is a, this is a new cap- this is one of the capabilities that you cannot back backport by implementing it in es3 javascript because this is something that the runtime has to enforce right so you cannot duplicate this functionality so you can do that then there is a, there are three other two other variants one is called seal and another is called freeze uh, so what are the difference between those um so seal so so prevent extensions allows disallows extensions right uh, but i can still go do this i can say name equals bar now if i print o dot name so i'll change this back to prevent extensions so it prints uh, o dot name is bar right now that that works now if i say freeze you will see that o dot name equals bar gets ignored right basically your object becomes read only nothing can be modified no properties can be changed sorry like the yeah yeah so in fact what i use this particular uh, feature for is when i want to declare or simulate enums so you, you have enums in java and c sharp right so for example i want to say uh, uh, you know input type so i'll say object dot object dot freeze and uh, you know i'll say uh, mouse is one keyboard is two right so now this becomes an this becomes an enum that you can use so i can say you know print or you know i can you know i can say input type dot mouse so what this also means is this this becomes a constant that will never change right so nobody can go and do this or nobody can go and do this which is more tricky uh right so you can see that it's still one so that's that's a great use for for freeze again these are features that cannot be backported you need runtime support object dot seal yeah it's the what is the difference reference good question i have no idea we can try that actually so if i say sorry yeah yeah so if i say who is this and uh, if i say name is that and uh, that's done right so if i say print sorry oh okay thanks so if i say input type dot foo dot name that's fine so anybody wants to hazard a guess what's going to happen now i think it will change so it change right i mean because that is another object it's shallow it's a shallow freeze is it possible that you are saying if i if i say var uh, s equals j is foo <coughs> and then s equals object dot freeze print s s equals who js print s what is happening i think i have too much craft there so this returned undefined looks like maybe an error huh? 
Ah. There you go. That's the answer. Only an object. Primitive types not allowed. Nice. For once, we get a good error. Um, so, okay. So, so, we saw freeze and print. So, uh, it's, it's like in, in, in the order that I've given, that's how restrictive it gets. So prevent extensions allows, disallows extensions, but you can edit. Seal uh, does what prevent extensions does, so you cannot extend. In addition, it goes and uh, makes your property descriptors unchangeable. Now I know that makes no sense. I'll talk about object.create, so we, we'll talk about property descriptors, then we'll come back and revisit seal, then you'll know uh, what seal disallows. And freeze is the most restrictive. So it does what prevent extension does, it does what seal does, and then it goes and makes all your properties, non-reference member properties, read-only. In fact, even references become read-only, so you can't assign that to some other object, but the object that it refers to is not read-only. Anyway, so, so, what, so, uh, so let's talk about properties, right? Properties and property descriptors. So I have this name foo here. Uh, imagine that, uh, you know, I don't want to wholesale uh, do what I've been doing. That is seal, free, prevent extension, the entire object. I want one particular property to be read only. Right? So let's say I have a, I have name here, I have age also. And uh, so I want name to be uh, read write and I want age to be read only. How can I do that? So that you can use the object.create syntax. So I'll use an empty object as the prototype. We saw this in the other uh, so folks who haven't come in the previous session. What what happens here is when you say object dot create, um, whatever you pass the first parameter becomes the prototype for the new object that gets created, right? Uh, so in this case, I'm passing an empty empty literal as the prototype object for O. So whatever O will be after this line its prototype will be this empty object, which is basically the object object. It doesn't have to be. Uh, we'll, show, we'll see an example of that, then that will be clearer. But what I'm going to show now is how you can, uh, uh, you know, extend this with new properties of your own. So the second parameter to object.create is basically uh, another object where you, where you basically specify what are the properties. So I want there to be a property called name, right? And here I'll give the attributes of that property. So what will be the initial value? So initial value will be this. Is it writable? So I'll say true. Is it enumerable? I'll say true. Is it configurable? I'll say it's true. So we'll see what all of these uh, all of these things mean. So if I want to make this read only, it must be pretty evident uh, what I should do. I'll say writable should be false. I'll say enumerable should be true and configurable to be true. So now if I say print o dot name, it will say o dot name is foo, o dot age is 10. Uh, so that's, uh, so I'll say print o dot name, print o dot age. So I'll say o dot name equals bar, o dot age equals 20 and uh, put the same thing here. And you can see that uh, foo 10 became bar 10. So the o dot age assignment did not work. Right, because you've declared o.age as uh, writable, uh, writable as false. So what are enumerable and configurable? Enumerable determines whether the property that you're defining uh, will show up when somebody reflects on your object. So it is possible to reflect on objects uh, in JavaScript. So uh, you, might, you might have heard of a syntax called for var i in, right, which you can use to, uh, in, uh, you know, so for, for, for instance, I can, I can do something like this. Uh, so I can say for var i in document dot body, uh, I can say print i, you know, so there you go, those, those are all the uh, properties available in the document body object, right? If you want to get the value of it, you can say document dot body of that property name, then you'll get the value also. I'm not going to do this here, I don't know what will happen, uh, so I won't do that, but you can do that for any object. Right? So if you just say var i in, it will enumerate. So this thing controls whether you can uh, do that for. So if I give o here, so let's go back to putting i. So it says there are name and age. So let's see what happens if I give false for name. So now you can see that 
name is not getting enumerated right only age is getting enumerated so that's what that controls whether you can um, enumerate stuff or not in fact this is uh, i mean <laughs> so let me let me show you so i'll comment this out so there is a keyword in javascript called debugger which you can use to insert a hard breakpoint into your into your code so if you have a debugger attached then when the runtime javascript engine ex encounters a debugger line it will break into the debugger so what i'll do is i'll uh, i'll change this to false copy that go to here and uh, i'll say start debugging that's okay we can ignore that looks like i have some fixing to do but i'll do that later so now if i hit control enter uh, the debugger hits that line and uh, you know you can debug it now the interesting thing is now the object has been created right i can go to my watch window and if i go hit o even here your name property won't show up so this can trip you up so once i i did this and i was like shocked now where did all my properties go you know i it didn't occur to me that i had made them non enumerable so remember that even the debugger respects it which is odd no i think it shouldn't respect that anyway maybe it can show it in a different color or something to show you that it's not any more available uh <clears throat> yeah i think it looks like so uh, so that's what that uh, controls configurable uh, true or false controls whether so so i i talk, i mentioned something called property descriptor earlier right so this is the property descriptor so this object so this object which uh, uh, configures this property is called the property descriptor configurable tells you whether you can alter this descriptor subsequently later on so for example i have uh, i have age as non writable right so if i sometimes my control key gets stuck okay so uh, so if i if i go do something like this if i say uh, print o dot age o dot age equals 20 print o dot age obviously no effect now what i can do is i can say object dot define property i can pass that object i can pass the name of the property and specify a new descriptor so i can say value uh doesn't matter 10 right and i can say writable is true i'm changing that i'll keep the other two the same enumerable is true configurable is true and now i'll take this code here and uh, paste that there so now you can see that initial didn't change but after i did the define property 10 becomes 20 right so basically this call here define property is used to change the property descriptor associated with a particular property so something that was not writable i have made it as writable so now we can go back and talk about uh, seal right so what seal does is it makes all your properties non non writable property descriptor non writable is as if you said earlier property descriptor calls all the properties that's what seal does in addition to prevent extensions right seal does what prevent extension does and then it goes and does this also all right so uh, so that's uh, th those are some of the new capabilities so you have defined property and uh, there is another uh, plural version of this called defined properties where uh, you can define multiple properties so how you do that is uh, the api is slightly different uh, in in case of defined property you specify the name of the property here and the descriptor in case of defined properties you basically pass in an object like this that's all just one more level of uh, indirection right so basically you pass an object which has properties with a name and the values are the descriptors exactly the same as what we did for object dot create so that's define uh, define properties interest of time i won't run it uh, <clears throat> i have a shorter session so if you want to like this is a important point to okay part. yeah next next stop is rama so <clears throat> all right so uh, we saw some of these so uh, there's, there's another interesting thing here the last line here get own property names and keys right so let's get rid of all the rest of this stuff here 
uh, I'll make this enumerable true. So you can say object dot keys of O. So this we saw in the previous session also. So what it does is it basically gives you the own properties of that particular object, right? Now uh, imagine that you do something like this: O2 equals object dot create. I'll pass O as my prototype, and I'll create some new properties here. So I'll say uh, gender as a property, and I'll say value is that writable. Bit of a pain to do all this, but <laughs> all right. Uh, maybe I'll make that true. Doesn't matter, right? So now if I uh, if I run O2 here, it only shows gender, right? Because it shows only the own properties. It doesn't. Sorry. Is it no, 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 no. Previous. Okay. I'm sorry, I gave you. No, 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 that's fine. I got permission. So, uh, so this gets the own properties, right? Uh, now there is there is another uh, get own property names is a, is another API, oops, which does exactly the same thing. Name, age, and and this. So you might wonder what is the difference? Why do you have two APIs that do the same thing? So let's see. So I'll say uh, keys, right? So it prints name and age. I'll go and make this enumerable false, so it prints only age, which is as expected. So now we can see that completely ignores your enumerable property. So in case you need to do that, you have a way of doing that. The debugger should have used this. <laughs> it's not doing that. Okay. So some of the some of the things I wanted to cover was trick mode. So I'll just briefly talk about strict mode, and I'll talk about function bind, and I'll stop. Okay. Strict mode is kind of important. In fact, it's probably the most important feature in ES5. So uh, JavaScript has a lot of warts, right? Many weird features. So uh, one of the things, one of the things that they did to fix this kind of was to introduce a new execution mode for extensive types of line JavaScript engines, where the semantics of the of the language changes. So some of the things that you could work in a certain way in unrestricted mode work differently in So this is, this is a new mode. Like we can like switch, turn the switch on, that that changes. So what can you do? So so these are some of the attributes of strict mode. Uh, very very simple to do it. Any code, right? It can be uh, global code, eval code. Or scope with functions, which means regular functions, stuff you put in eval, which we shouldn't do, and global code. All of this can be strict mode code. And how do you make it strict? Just prefix it with one line like this. Use strict in a string. Now the beauty of this is uh, your code will work perfectly fine in ES3 engines, right? Because uh, an ES3 JavaScript engine will encounter this line. It will find that you've created a string and you've discarded it. It'll probably not think very highly of you. But it will just ignore it and continue, right? Whereas ES5, it, this has a special meaning. So as soon as it sees this, it will change your language. Some interesting things: nested functions inherit strictness. So if you create a function, say use strict, and you have some code, and then you define a function inside that function, whether you say use strict inside that function or not, it is strict. So nested functions will inherit the strictness. Uh, strictness won't cross call stack boundaries, which might be as expected. Right. So if you have function A, function B, function B is strict, but function B is calling function A, which is non-strict. So function A will run as non-strict, function B will run as strict. Right. So it won't cross call stack boundaries, which is, I think, correct. <coughs> so that's the syntax. Uh, these are some of the semantics. Uh, the first one itself is worth worth it, right? So you cannot create a variable without declaring it. So you can't simply say name equals value. You have to say var something, declare it, and then only you can assign to it, which is awesome because you cannot accidentally introduce identifiers into global scope. So as that's what uh, you know you might have seen, right? They're showing some simple, uh, I think again, Shreya session. So if you say a equals 10, uh, b equals 20, right? It might look tricky, but this is not correct. 
because i meant to put a comma here i put a semicolon so b equals 20, uh, 20 now becomes a property of your window so if i say print window dot b it will print 20 <laughs> right so you never knew that this is what is happening but that's what the javascript runtime meant and did it added that to the window object so <clears throat> if i say strict in fact we can try that so if i say strict here use strict i'll have to give it a name i think the next session people are waiting so it's not fair for them uh so you can nothing happened that's unusual so what i was expecting is an error <coughs> to show up here which would say that uh, there we go just needed a refresh <laughs> variable undefined in strict mode right so you can't do that it will throw an error which is which is an awesome feature so i'll share this deck with everybody on my blog uh, so you can can go through that i've actually made some posts about this as well uh looks like i don't have time for function dot bind which is uh, one of my favorite ps5 features okay what function dot bind does is if you have a function uh you saw that call that i was talking about right where you can pass a context you can permanently bind a context with a function so you can say some function dot bind of some context that will return another function which is permanently bound to that context so whether you call it as f like that or f dot call it doesn't really matter whatever you bound it it's permanently bound to that object so you can go and try that so just create a global function say this dot uh, something equals something right and then bind it to one particular object where that property has a certain value then try calling it with a different context it won't take effect call it without any context you still have a context so, right basically it it allows you to uh, you know bind a context permanently to a function so which is good in many many situations so that's how you can get in touch with me and that's it thank you